This is the Pearson LXL Further Mechanics paper from 2019, Mechanics 1 I should say. Uh, it's from this book here with I believe what is the Sydney Opera House on it, suggesting maybe that it takes mechanics to build stuff, which makes me wonder why the butterfly is on core pure maths. Bit confusing, but okay, let's get straight into it. So we've got these two walls three meters apart. You're projecting an object from this point here, this gray speed u. It's going to hit this wall. It's going to hit all the way back to this wall and then come back again. And you want to know the time it takes to get all the way back here. So it goes there, there, and there again. You want to show the time it gets takes to get back here is this. The coefficient of restitution on each wall, I believe, is two thirds. And uh, and yeah, so we've got a couple of things to do here. Firstly, the speed of separation over speed of approach is that coefficient e. So the speed of approach to this wall is clearly u. The speed away from it, we could just call if we wanted to uh, v, but if we did that, we'd have v over u is two thirds, and then we just get v is two thirds u. Um, so this speed going away is two thirds u. And we can do that again over here, right? When it hits this wall, again, uh, approach is two thirds u. The wall isn't moving, obviously, so it's just two thirds u. You could say that this speed here is v now, v over two thirds u equals two thirds, and you will get this is four thirds, sorry, four ninths u. So okay, we have our speed this way is u, this way is two thirds u, this way is four ninths u for the second time. And now we just need to do some speed equals distance over time, except we want the times, right? So time is distance over speed. So the time it takes to do this first bit is going to be the distance, which is d over the speed, which is u. So that's going to be d over u. The time it takes to do this bit is the distance, which is three over the speed, which is this. And then the final bit here, the distance is three minus d. And the speed is that, so we'll put those in. Uh, we can, of course, uh, simplify this a little bit. I think we'll get this when we do that. Then, of course, we can make all the dominators the same by timesing this by 4 and this by 2. And then we can finally put all these together, and I believe we get exactly what they wanted us to get. Good, six marks, nice and easy. The fixed, uh, the value of u is fixed. So we're going to project at this, this, this is just a constant now, we're going to project it at some speed. And uh, the particle is still each, each wall once, so it's doing the same thing, and the value of d can now vary. So now you can choose where to put this point when you start projecting it. Find the least possible time for it to do this, this, this. Now, at first you're tempted to do some proper maths here, but always, always look how many marks is the question worth. It's worth two. So I reckon, having seen enough mark schemes, I reckon it's one mark for the answer, and it's one mark, like, the, the, the value of the answer, and one mark for blagging why that answer is the thing that it is. You're not supposed to do any proper maths here. So I reckon if we pull this starting point all the way back to this wall, what that means is it does the fastest speed possible, which is just u, for as long as possible. And then it does the second fastest speed all the way down here. You can't change how long it does this bit for. And then it will do this last speed for, I mean, basically zero. If you put this all the way back at the starting wall, it will hit the wall and finish its journey at the same time. So if we move this all the way back, we're, we're taking advantage of the highest speed for as long as possible and the lowest speed for as least as possible. So I reckon we just need to set d to be three. Um, and that's my blagging, and uh, and now of course I can put d as three into there, and I'll find my time in terms of u, and that's for the second mark will get you will be this bit, I guess. Uh, simplify that to fifteen over two, but it, sure. Okay, question number two. So we have this entry speed, angle alpha, and then angle beta. Now I, I talked about this in the twenty twenty paper. It's a show that question. So if you just use tan, uh, sorry, the e on this wall is different to e on this wall. It's only a half. That's interesting. Now if you just use this, you'll get zero marks. Um, so if you know this, then great. It's useful sometimes. But if, if you see us show that question, you kind of need to show them where this comes from. So what you need to do is you need to go into here and go, okay, let's look at the components of the velocity here. So we've got a component this way, um, and a component this way, and a component this way, and a component this way. I've just called this speed after this bit v, or this velocity maybe, or speed. Oh, it doesn't really matter. I've called that v. Now, this is going to, of course, be 6 sine alpha. This is going to be 6 cos alpha. This is going to be v sine, sorry, v cos beta. This is going to be v sine beta. Just writing it there because it's out of space. And we can say, if you're hitting a wall like this, the uh, component that's parallel to the wall uh, is not going to change. So 6 cos alpha equals v cos beta. And, and if you're, uh, that's this bit here, sorry. And this one comes from the fact that, again, we saw the equation in question number one, speed of separation over speed of approach equals e. The approach to this wall is this, 6 sine alpha. Um, and the going away is v sine beta. So um, approach, separation is this divided by this equals e means that this times e is this, I believe, and that's where this comes from. So I always just, just get this one times by e, and you get this one, and that's what I can write down. And then, of course, if you do this divided by this, you'll get some tans, which is helpful. The b's and, and the 6's cancel, 
and then you can say e equals tan beta over tan alpha, thus showing what they what I kind of just know anyway. But of course, they've told us tan alpha is is this and tan beta is this, so we can just put those in now, and we'll get e is three over twelve, which is one over four, um, and 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 I think that will get us all of the marks according to the mark scheme. Uh, question number B then, find the speed of the ball immediately after it hits BC. So we're looking for the speed as it leaves here. There's, there's quite a few ways you could go about doing this. What I decided to do was take tan alpha equals four thirds. Now imagine a triangle in your heads with four as the opposite, three as the adjacent. That'll be a three, four, five triangle. So that means sine of alpha is four over five. Four is the opposite, so that's still the opposite. And cos of alpha is three over five. Um, and likewise for this one, that's going to be a one, three. One squared plus three squared is root 10. So it's a 1, 3, root 10 triangle. Imagine that in your heads. And therefore, sine is going to be 1 over root 10, and cos is going to be 3 over root 10. So I thought I'd get all those, just because I can. It's always good practice to just do that. And, um, okay, to find the speed uh, immediately afterwards, well, we, we can match some things up here, right, can't we? Because we know, as I've already said, this times e is that, but I know e is a quarter now. And I also know sine alpha, and I also know, know sine beta. So I can do all of that, and I can find v is this. So that's fine, that's there. And then we can look at the next impact and we can say, okay, well, parallel to the wall, this had speed V sine beta, and that doesn't change. So this speed here, going this way, we can call this W, but this one here, I don't know this angle, and I could label it something, but I don't need to, because what, like if I enable this gamma, this would be W gamma, sorry, W sine gamma. But I know it's the same as this one, right? This speed doesn't change when you when you have an impact like this. So this is just v sine beta as well, this this bit here. And this component is just uh, the component that you enter, this one, times by e, as I've said before. So it's going to be this times by e. And I have all this information. I have v, and I have cos beta, and I have uh, sine beta as well. So this one here, uh, v, this times sine beta for this one here. Well, the roots tens cancel, the one doesn't matter, so it's just six fifths, so that's just six fifths. And this one here, e times v, well, e is uh, a half, times v is there, so that's six tenths, times cos, where the roots tens cancel, so you get six tenths times three is 18 tenths, which is nine fifths, I believe. So that one's there. And now, of course, w is just this squared plus this squared square rooted, and we'll get some decimal answer for that just two ways the model could be refined. We'll just read through this and just look for any assumptions. So for example, um, I can see that uh, we're assuming the ball is a particle. So to improve this, you could actually model it as some kind of sphere, maybe. The wall and the floors are being smooth. So improve that, you could make some friction uh, in here. Anything like that. Um, and that's just from the stuff that they've said, that they've assumed. Like you could even write stuff about air resistance. You could write stuff about spin on the particle, which would obviously change it as it hits stuff. Uh, as all snooker players know. But yeah, that's that's just something that you can say. Good. Question number three is a long nine marker. So we first, of course, draw a picture here. Uh, impulse is mv minus mu. I think I'll start drawing in a second. We know u is this, and we know the magnitude of the impulse is this. So let's call the impulse lambda mu, because that's what they've done here. We know that's, uh, and I'm going to call the uh, second velocity as ab. So I think we get this, which I can simplify to be this if I want to. We also know about lambda u, mu that because the magnitude is this, we know that lambda squared plus mu squared is this squared. So I'll write that up there as well. Now let's draw a picture because that's actually, actually the picture that's the key part here. We have an initial velocity of 4, 4. So that's just going up 4 across, 4 up, which means, of course, that its angle here is 45 degrees, working in degrees because they are there. So the angle here of this vector is 45 degrees there. So when you've got, uh, and you're told that it's deflected through 45 degrees, now it could be deflected in one of two ways. It could be deflected upwards, in which case when, when you're going 45 and you're deflected 45, you'll be going up 90. So actually you'll be going straight up, which means your vector will be of the form something, uh, sorry, zero something, because you're not going left and right. So this final velocity, instead of being a, b, I know a will be zero because it's just going up and, and b will be whatever b is. And that's because, again, deflection of 45 degrees, 45 deflected this way gets you to 90. Or you could be deflected from above, um, in which case you, you might flatten out like this. Def again, deflected 45 degrees this way instead, and now you're going straight horizontal, which means that the vector will be of the form something zero. And this is the key idea, right? Because now we can just work in the two cases. We can say, okay, in the first case, this case here, a must be zero, which means lambda mu, we can just replace a as zero and say is this. Um, and we can continue with this, right? We can say, okay, so lambda is, is, is minus two and, and mu is this. We can substitute those values into here. Minus two squared is just two squared, so that's fine. Square that for four, take it away. Uh, square root, you get plus or minus root 1.5, of course. Uh, add two and uh, divide by 
0 0.5, you get this. And so B is either 7 or 1, which I can then put back into here to find my two options for lambda mu, uh, the, the impact, sorry, the um, impulse vector. And we get these two answers. So those are my first two options. Um, and secondly, we can look at case number two, where instead we're, we're here and, and uh, I think if I just magically change those to, oh well. Um, so here, and, uh, and A is now some number, which apparently is called Y, and B is zero this time. Um, but it's okay, we can just say A is this, B is zero, so lambda mu becomes that, put that back into there. And everything is exactly the same, right? Like it literally exactly the same, except you find A is seven or one, and then you put that into there and you just end up again with the same vectors put upside down and you get those four vectors. It's useful maybe to think about whether or not these make sense. So like these two came from the first case. So you're traveling on here, you have an impulse of minus two, which is this way, 1.5 up. So impulse like this, well, that makes a lot of sense that it would start going up here or an impulse of minus two, 1.5. So that's minus two is going this way and 1.5 is going down because it's a magnitude as well, so an impulse this way. And that also makes sense, right? Because these could, they, things could sort of deflect from each other and the this one goes like this and this one goes like this and, and that also makes sense. And like otherwise, I think you can justify that those two make sense in your head as well. And anyway, those are the four answers. Let's get to question number four. Not sure what happened with this X and Y. That was, I think I must have just forgot what I typed the first time. Although I copy and paste so much. Really don't know how it happened. Anyway, uh, massive 600. I think I took a break halfway through that, that question and came back to it. And I'm waffling. Let's get to question number four properly now. So a car of mass, this is this. Okay, so that's, I think the first part requires a different picture to the second part. So we'll get rid of that. We'll draw a picture for the first part. Uh, there's the car, there's the trailer, there's the thing, the, the tow, I guess, or, or whatever. It's inextensible. This is the floor. So, okay, we have a uh, resistance of 200 newtons there. We have a resistance of 200 plus lambda V there, depending on what V is. And we have a driving uh, work rate of 15,000 watts. Uh, of course, um, power is equal to F times V. V is 25. So divide this by 25 and we get our force of 600. So that's actually 600 newtons going this way. Now we set up F equals MA, of course. This minus this minus this is equal to M, which is all of this times the acceleration, but we're going at a constant speed, so A is zero, which just means that this is balanced with these two. Um, so uh, we can write zero, or we can just write this is equal to this and this, it doesn't really matter. You, of course, get rid of that, and you eventually get lambda as eight. Good. So that's the easy four marks to start with. Part two, you have to draw on a slope, a uh, slope of, uh, uh, of theta here. Everything else stays pretty much the same. I've written this as 1,500 newtons because it says that the speed is 10. So I did 15,000 divided by 10 for 1,500 as our force going forwards, so I hope that's okay. I could have also, I guess, just put V as 10 into there, come to think of it, but copying and pasting meant that it just stayed as what it was. So, okay, that's fine. Um, cool, so uh, find the acceleration of the car immediately after the tow. So the tow bar breaks. So there's actually this force back here doesn't matter, but uh, this one still will, and another force will also matter, which is, of course, gravity on the car. So this is mg going straight down, 600g, and we draw that little triangle, uh, and this one here is going to be mg sine theta going down this way. This one divided by 15 is uh, 40, so we get 40g going down. And so when the tow bar breaks, you have this force going forwards, this one going backwards, this one going backwards, with this being 10, uh, equals ma, where a is... Uh, I've also drawn the triangle down here, same kind of triangle, don't need it right now. F equals MA, you have this minus uh, this with V being 10, minus this equals MA, this being M of course, and we can solve this for A very quickly and we get this as our answer. Good, use the work energy principle to find the value of D. Now D is the distance that the trailer kind of just loosely runs up the slope. So imagine the tow bar breaks and the trailer, because it's got some velocity in this direction, it will just kind of continue going up a little bit before it stops eventually. And it wants us to find how far that distance is. So okay, um, work energy principle, let's think about energy change then. So loss in kinetic energy, it was traveling at 10. And of course, when it comes to rest after rolling forward, it's gonna be traveling, it's at rest. So velocity zero, so connected to energy zero. So loss in kinetic energy is just half mv squared, where v is the original v, so that's that. The gain in, pot in pot uh, yeah, potential energy is what I meant. It travels d up the slope, but of course we drew a little triangle here to find out how much vertical distance it gained, because when you're using out uh, mgh for potential energy, you need the vertical distance. Uh, of course, this theta is the same as this theta, so this is just d sine theta, which is d over 15. So the gain in potential energy is m times g times d sine theta. d sine theta is this, m is that, so we get that, so that's our gain in potential energy. And uh, the work rate 
energy principle is that the um, the work done, which is uh, the resistance times the distance that resistance went for. Of course, in real life, this distance would vary, but we're told it's just a constant 200 at all times full stop, um, which is ridiculous, but okay. So this times by the distance that it went up the slope D is the work done, that's obviously 200 D. That's equal to the um, overall shift or change in energy, which is gonna be this one minus this one. Um, our loss in kinetic as opposed to our gain in potential. And we can just solve this for D very quickly and we'll get D as this, and that'll be our answer. Okay, question number, uh, and then, uh, oh yes, this is an interesting nugget from the uh, from the mark scheme. You'd actually be penalized if you wrote this to more decimal places than this, because at some point here, I decided that G was just 9.8. Um, and that's only two significant figures. Apparently you lose marks if you then put your answer more accurately than that because you sort of have no right to because you've already estimated g to be 9.8 um yeah that's kind of interesting i've never seen that written out as before i haven't looked at that many mechanics mark schemes though so maybe that's a very usual thing anyway question number five we've got two particles traveling towards each other um one at a speed of 2u one at a speed of u like this with these masses good and we have a collision and the coefficient is e this time and afterwards, they're traveling in opposite directions. Now, of course, they can't travel through each other. So that means this one must turn around and be going this way, and this one must turn around and be going this way. So that's useful to know. Uh, and it says, given that information, find the range of values of E. So we set up the two equations that we that we always set up in this, which is the one about conservation of momentum and the one about um, the coefficient E. So I don't know which one I did first, this one apparently. So V minus minus U. I, I should have just written V in this direction. But I'm claiming here that V is a positive number and going this way, which makes the, um, of course, if it was this way, it'd be a negative number. But that, what I need to do then is write it like this, because the distance that, it, like imagine that this was five in this direction and this was three in this direction. The velocity of separation would be five minus minus three for eight, right? So I need to write it like this, which gives me a plus in total. Of course, this, the same kind of thing is, is two U minus minus U for three U. Um, anyway, we get this times by 3u, we have this as our first equation. Second equation, conservation momentum, this times this, plus minus this, because that's going this way, times this. So that's the minus 4u there, equals, again, minus this, because it's going the other way, plus this. Uh, I probably could have drawn this more sensibly, but as long as you understand what you draw, that's all that matters. Anyway, we have this, we cancel all the m's, obviously, we get this. And, uh, and we have two simultaneous equations. We have this one, uh, which I'll write like this, and we have this one, which I think I wrote slightly more sensibly like this. If we times this one by three and add them together, we'll get five W equals this minus this. Okay, that's the first one, the second thing I did apparently. How did I make this then? I times it by two and then took them away. Yeah, this minus minus this is this, and then this times by two minus that. Minus minus makes a plus, good. Okay, and now we have these two things. Now, what's critical here is that I'm claiming V and W are both positive numbers, if I've drawn it like this, right? V is a positive number, so it's definitely going this way. V is a positive number, so by this arrow, it means it's going the other way with that velocity. So let's just argue that these are positive numbers for a second. Now, this clearly is a positive number, like obviously, because these are all positives. E is trapped between zero and one. U itself is positive, because that's what my initial drawing said. Um, so this is trivially positive. This one is less trivially positive. I want this bit, the five doesn't really matter. I just want that bit to be positive. Cancel out the U's because they're not zero and they're positive. That means I can write this, uh, add one to both sides after you do that, and you get E is greater than a ninth. So my range for E is actually from a ninth to one, and I have this. I think I should have drawn a uh, equal to there. I just mistyped that. That should be a, an all equal to line there as well, I think. Okay, so that's that. Given that Q loses 75% of its kinetic energy, so kinetic energy half mv squared. Um, so, okay, so to start with, Q is this side, right? So to start with, its kinetic energy is a half times 2m times 2u all squared, which is this. And to end with, its kinetic energy is a half times 2m times w squared. w is a fifth of that, so I just need to square that. I also factorized out a u, just because I figured to square this, I could square this for a 25th, this for a u squared, and then this would be slightly easier to square without the u in it. It squares to this. Actually, expanding this out, I later learned by looking at the mark scheme, is not the most sensible thing to do here. But anyway, it still works. So this is the, the kinetic energy afterwards. Now, it loses 75% of its kinetic energy. Now, just make sure you get this right, right way around. If you take the kinetic energy before and times that by 0 0.25, you'll get the kinetic energy afterwards. Make sure you put that. I've seen, I've marked so many papers where this kind of thing will be on the wrong side, both in GCSE and A-level. This one 
decreased by 75% will be the other one. If you put the 0 0.25 there, you're suggesting that this is much bigger than this one, which is obviously wrong. So, okay, this cancel was this, which is good. The M's cancel, which is good. The U squared's cancel, which is good. So I think I'm just going to get an 1 over here, times it by 25, and I think I get this. And then take away the 25, and I'm just going to solve for E here. This is nice, right, because... Oh, no, uh, you I, actually, you don't know. Divide everything by three. Of course, you could just put that in a calculator, couldn't you? But I, I thought I just wanted to see if I could do this without one, and I could. It does factorize. It's not the easiest spot, but you get E is two-thirds, or E is minus four-ninths, which obviously can't work because it's between zero and one, and we have our answer. Good, so only two questions to go there, and we've got one of these ones where two uh, spheres are colliding now. Uh, one of them has velocity three, two, and the other one has velocity minus four, minus uh, one like this, they meet on a horizontal center line, which is important because if they meet horizontally like this, that means the vertical components are preserved. So this one will still be going up with um, 2j and this one will still be going down with 1j. Uh, so that's still preserved. And now if I just say, uh, maybe this one's going across with now ai and this one's going this way with maybe uh, bi, um, uh, this has come up too early, e is 3 sevenths, but let's just look at conservation of um, horizontal momentum here, I think is what I'm looking at. So I said m times the horizontal current, so 0 0.2 times 3 plus 0 0.4 times minus 4 is equal to 0 0.2 times b plus 0 0.4 times a. This time I've, I've done what I sort of talked about in the previous question, which is just make everything go this way. Um, and, and just accept that B is going to be a negative number maybe, but that's fine. So, okay, let's expand this out and, 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 and we get this. Also looking at the other equation that we're going to make, of course, which is um, to do with E, we can just look at it horizontally again. All right, so um, the speed of separation is 3 minus minus 4. Sorry, that's the speed of approach, of course, 3 minus minus 4. Speed of separation is A minus B. So A minus B over 3 minus minus 4 is equal to 3 sevenths. 3 minus minus 4 is 7, of course. Cancel the sevenths and you get this. And this is my simultaneous equation. I think I can times this by 5 just to be sensible. And then I think I can do, uh, what, what did I do here? Um, double this one and do this, take away this. That seems like what I did. Yeah, double this. This take away this will get me this. And so B is minus 3 elevenths. And the reason I was looking for B was because the question is find the velocity of A immediately after. And A is this one. So the velocity is uh, minus 11 over 3, 2 as a comma, as a column vector, which is how I like to write vectors. I know they like to write them like this, but I always write them like this. Okay, find the magnitude of the impulse received by A. So again, okay, well, I is just mv minus mu, as we saw earlier. Its initial velocity is this, its final velocity is this, so we can just put that in. Its mass is 0 0.2. This is a very easy question. Um, now, the it's asking for the magnitude, so you can't just finish here. But of course, the magnitude of this is just 4 thirds, right? You could do some Pythagoras, but guess what? 0 squared is 0, so it's just going to be 4 thirds, and, uh, and that'll be uh, the answer to B. This question here, fi finally, find the size of the angle deflected. Uh, again of, of, of a so a was going at 3 2 and and then it starts going at minus 11 over 3 2 so we want to find this angle here uh, the, it's been deflected around this way uh, there's there's a few ways you could get out some triangles and do some basic trig and just add up the results or you could do some dot products you, you obviously do your corporeal math so you can do dot products let's do this dot this over their two magnitudes equals cos of theta where theta is this angle here. I think that will work. Um, this dot this, well, this turns out quite nice, doesn't it? So it's minus 11 plus four. Uh, over this, type all of that into calculus, you get this, do cos inverse, you get that. And, uh, and you'll have your answer to the nearest degree. It was something else, but to the nearest degree, it's just gonna be that. Good, uh, question number seven, then last one, it's about elasticity. What I quite like about all of mechanics, really, is that if you just do some past papers, maybe I should have said this at the start, Past papers are so valuable in mechanics because the same questions turn up over and over again. Like I could have bet my house that the last question was about uh, elastic strings or springs because they haven't asked it yet and they ask it every single time. So it's, it's so good to practice mechanics on past papers because there are only like six or I think there's only five chapters in the textbook. So you're going to see, you know what five of the questions are one of them will be on this, and then the other two are usually just, you know, a combination of other things. But you know this is coming up, so we knew it was saying, so let's, let's make sure we can do it. Of course, the questions are different, but here's a ceiling. that You've got a spring. It's important this is a spring, and I'll explain why in a second. Uh, it's being stretched to 3a. Its natural length is a, I think it says somewhere. Uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, uh, and you've got m down here. 
and then what happens is you're holding it here you let go of course the spring pulls it up until it gets to here now it's important that it's a spring in this picture because it means that if it was a string then as it kind of pulled itself back when it passed its natural length it will just go loose and not have any energy in it but if it's a spring it's still got stored elastic energy in here because it's been kind of pushed um, together I can't think of what the word is squashed I think is the word um, and it's still got some elastic energy which we'll use in a second later um, so okay so these are our two pictures um, to start with I immediately just wrote down mg and then I wrote a, a, a t here a tension here and of course tension is this formula lambda is uh, kmg l is a and x now x the natural length is a it's currently sitting at 3a x is the stretch so x is 2a so if we shove all of that in 2a into here a into there kmg into there we get that the tension is this um, now I actually don't need that for part a part a is just asking about k um, and to, to, to find what k is actually the, the, the best thing to do is just think about energy um, so right here we have a lot of stored elastic energy right um, via this formula and these two formulas you just need to know again you know this question is coming up so you just need to know these two formulas one for tension one for stored energy um, x is again 2a uh, l is uh, is a lambda is kmg um, and that's the energy that we have here and, th and that's the initial elastic energy now we also have elastic energy here like i said it's a string it's a spring that's being squashed so let's put this same thing in but this time the stretch is a half a because it was a down to a half a is a stretch of a half a so we'll put that in with the same thing and we'll get this so this is the initial elastic energy this is the ending initial elastic energy so the difference from here to here is this much that's the change in elastic energy that we have uh, from here to this this picture here now how do we make up for that change well there's an increase in potential energy right because it's being moved up it's gone up by 2.5a so potential energy is mgh so we just literally just have to do mg times 2.5a or 5 over 2a and we get this increase in potential energy and so now we have this increase in potential energy must equal the decrease in elastic energy we set them equal we times by 2 we divide by 5 we cancel out all the mgas and eventually we'll get this in fact divide by 15 times by 8 and then cancel those and we get k as 4 thirds so okay that's 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 that bit and now this bit actually next is very easy I, i've replaced by the way this 4 thirds into here this next bit is very easy because acceleration where well, we just look at this and go f equals ma so this minus this equals m times a uh, of course we just solve that very quickly cancel out the m's we get a as this so that's easy three marks and the final question here now i've um i did this question in a way that i was really proud of myself for i thought it was really good um and then i looked at the marks and saw there was a slightly easier way to do it but i'm going to go through the method that i did anyway just because it contains a lot of good maths i talked about this i said okay let's pretend that this is the point here where it's at its maximum velocity and we'll say that it's traveled up h to get there let's think about the change in energy from this situation to this situation now it's gained kinetic energy of course because it was at rest so the gaining kinetic energy is just a half mv squared where v is just whatever highest velocity it's going at this point the gain in potential energy is just of course mgh because it's just gone up h now the loss in elastic energy is a bit more complicated we had this previous elastic energy that we talked about before but with k as four thirds this time because we know k is four thirds so this is the elastic energy at the start but we still have elastic energy when we're at this point um, and 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 the stretch is going to be well the stretch was 2a so the new stretch is 2a minus h and so imagine imagine the spring had a hundred joules of elastic energy when it was here and only 50 when it's here the change is going to be 100 minus 50 so we're going to do this elastic energy minus this one to, to find the loss and the gain in kinetic and potential must equal that loss in elastic energy so we we set up this we cancel out all the m's obviously we simplify these a little bit and i also brought the gh onto the other side so we get this now what's my plan here well my plan is to say i want v to be as big as possible so why don't i just consider this as a function of h and then differentiate it and set it to zero and that will find um the the place where this whole thing is at a maximum which will therefore mean i can find whatever maximum v is uh, so i just made this a function of h differentiated it this goes away because it's not going h isn't it i use some product rule here or no it's sorry chain rule bring the two down times by the uh, take make it a one derivative of this is minus one so that cancels with that uh, and then everything else stays the same this of course just in register minus g set that to be zero um and solve that right just solve that so the eight six also made a 
became a 4, 3 at some point. Uh, so add the g's times by 3a, divide by 4, cancel the g's at this point maybe as well you notice, uh, and then do h over here, take away this, and we get h is this. So I think when h is 5 over 4a upwards, that's when we're going at maximum speed, I think. And I, I could differentiate again to justify that it's a maximum, not a minimum, but I really can't be bothered. I don't think I, that I don't think that will be worth any mark, so I'm just not going to. But of course, I need to find the actual speed here. So we had this expression for the velocity was all this, and I'm going to substitute in that five fourths a into there. So we had that expression before here. This is my expression for v. Going to substitute the h that I just found into there, and we find this. Do a bunch of simplifying and stuff. I, I've done this quite slowly, so you can follow my logic if you want to. Um, but eventually you get this, which is this. Some stuff cancels, of course, and you end up with this. So that's a half v squared, and then of course we can times everything by two, which will get us this. We can square root, and we'll have our v uh, here, which I think will be the maximum speed attained. And uh, and then I uh, I was quite happy with myself about the answer. Uh, it's correct. I then saw that there was a result that you're just allowed to use, which saves you a bit of time on these questions, and that result is that maximum speed is attained when the forces are balanced. Um, you're just allowed to quote that. So, okay, what you can say is, for instance, just to talk you through the start of it, let's go from the other end this time. Let's say that this distance is mu a. Uh, you'll see why I've tagged the arm in just a second. Let's say the distance is mu a. So let's say the ball has moved from here to maybe here, and this distance is mu a. Now, the tension in the spring, based on this thing, is 4 thirds mg, 4 thirds from here, mg, yeah, uh, and the stretch is this, mu a, and the reason I tagged an a in there was to make it cancel with this l here, so that cancels to just become this, and you can just quote that you've got maximal speed when this force going upwards equals this force, um, and then you can solve that for mu, which equals three quarters, which makes a lot of sense because three quarters down this way will balance with the um, five fourths that I found going upwards. Of course, they add to make two, and that's the initial stretch here. And, and of course, once you've got that, you can then just make the same energy equation that I did, but just immediately substitute this value in there. Make sure the equation works from this perspective if you're doing it this way now, uh, and you'll get your answer. But yeah, this is worth mentioning that it you, you can just, if you get questions like this, you can quote that maximal speed occurs when the forces are balanced, um, which is an interesting thing to quote that I just forgot. So I kind of, I guess I probably just sort of derived that result by differentiation and stuff. But yeah, anyway, that was a really nice paper.